Realm presents Outliers, a Realm original. Episode one. There's always been just the two of us, Don and me. I have never seen another human, not alive anyway. My mother and father died when I was an infant, so their barely remembered faces are a blur and their faded voices gibberish. Da took pity on me and carried me on his back, swaddled in a knapsack to where we are now. He told me the story many times, of the hardship of the formidable bone-chilling terrain we traversed to get to our home. He'd been an old man even then. The road north would have been punishing for a much younger man. He had pushed on for my sake. He'd say, this is your origin story, boy. He'd tell it with pride. The story mattered more to him than to me. I really don't remember much from before I could walk or talk. In the before, the planet was populated with humans. Da lived during mankind's preeminence, and he recounted of his idyllic life as a college professor on a small campus in a northern state where all the brick classroom buildings had been cloaked in ivy vines. He'd been surrounded by people, first as a sibling in a happy tribe of brothers and sisters, and later as a man with a wife and kids of his own. Three daughters, he told me, chest swelling with pride. A big house filled with the tinkling laughter of children and then grandchildren. All gone now. I don't know if I had a brother or sister. Da doesn't know either. When I was much younger, I dug up the grave of a boy in a forgotten cemetery and found the bones strapped together with stringy tendons that looked like dried leather shoelaces. The skull was roughly the same size as mine. The teeth were yellow, though, like the molars of an aging horse. I kept the skull hidden in the woodpile for a while. I didn't want Da to know I'd taken it. Desecrated a grave, even though I meant no disrespect. I talked to the grinning skull now and then, imagining I was Tom Sawyer and it was Huck Finn, and we were like brothers. That's from Mark Twain. I can read. Don't mistake me for illiterate. Da taught me to read first thing. Well, after I learned to walk, to use the outhouse, and to shoot a rifle. First letters, then words, then sentences, then books. Maybe I don't converse a lot since Da's grown more taciturn, but I've read a thousand books from cover to cover, leafed through ten times more, fiction and nonfiction. I devoured two complete sets of old hardcover encyclopedias, Funk and Wagnalls and Encyclopedia Britannia. I've read piles and piles of academic journals and popular magazines, too. I proudly recited every word and definition in my Webster's two new Riverside Desk Dictionary aloud to Da during one long summer back when he still smiled occasionally. Da sometimes laments what's been lost. Grieves, even. But the way things are is fine with me. I have no memories of the before. I read by candlelight, or by the flickering firelight from the hearth like Abraham Lincoln did when he was a boy. Da sits in his recliner chair and methodically cleans his rifle, the pleasant scent of gun oil and wood smoke filling our cabin. I feel at home. This may not be the life I chose, but this life suits me just fine. In the winter, when we were pillaging in the abandoned towns and villages to the north, we searched for books. First, we gathered whatever stockpile essentials we could find. Things like salt, bullets, batteries, lighter fluid, tinder and matches, first aid and medicinal supplies, especially bandages, swabs, cotton balls, and Da's three A's, antiseptics, analgesics, and antibiotics. Canned fruits, packaged gravy, and iodine for purifying water sometimes firearms if we could find the right ammo along with them. Then we'd leaf through the books we came across with an eye to adding to our own growing library. Electronics we ignored because there was no electric grid anymore. Plugs are useless. Wall sockets are dead. Wi-Fi and cable have gone the way of the dinosaurs and the internet no longer exists. Flat screen televisions mounted on the walls of nearly every residence we ransack are nothing but blank picture frames. Since the wind turbines spanning the low valley have rusted and collapsed, Gasoline power is all that's left. We've stockpiled a bunch of five-gallon containers with gas siphoned from abandoned cars, but we only ever use our gasoline sparingly, for the generator and sometimes for the truck. We'd load our sled and haul our commandeered goods to the snow-covered woods to our valley, to our fortified Quonset warehouse. I built the shelves myself with planks I'd found at an abandoned sawmill, loaded the shelves with books all the way to the ceiling. I don't much care for the Dewey Decimal System, so I arranged them in an order that matters only to me. Adventure stories are what I like most of all. 
Da believes it's because the hero prevails no matter the hardship or loss he must endure. But Da finds subtext in everything he reads. I don't. I may not be ignorant, but I'm not clever that way. I just like a good story. In the hot months, we couldn't venture out of our compound, so after we finished the chores, we'd read in our cabin. Read in the sweltering heat, all the windows wide open to the humid breeze, each of us shrouded in a teepee of mosquito netting. Da in his recliner chair. Me sprawled across the old couch. Long, lazy summer days. I'd be so immersed in the pages of a book that I'd barely notice the screams and howls of the outliers beyond the fence. The outliers. Our lives revolve around them. I have a thesaurus, so I know there are a lot of words for what they represent for us. Call them adversaries, enemies, foes, or indigenous predators. They're all those things. But Da has always referred to them as outliers, so I do too. I looked their word up in one of my dictionaries. Outliers. 1. Something differing from all other members of an environment. 2. Something situated away or detached from other living things. Not exact, but close enough. Outliers is what we've always called them, and it suits. Our fortified perimeter consists of heavy-duty chain-link wire topped with rolls of concertina wire. Dodd chose our property because of the existing 15-foot security fencing, the reinforced gates, and the existence of a row of insulated Quonset huts that had been erected on cement slabs within the perimeter. The fencing had been erected to protect the vehicles and the warehouse supplies, everything from shovels to road signs to orange plastic cones, from most likely vandals and thieves, now protects us from the outliers. There's an existing bunkhouse on the property with two long rows of bunk beds and cupboards full of wool blankets and pillows that had probably housed road workers or emergency personnel at one time. All the on-site outhouses are connected to a septic system. Dodd described first setting eyes on our compound as like coming upon an already erected fort during the bloodiest days of the French and Indian War. Instant fortification. Instant safety. A refuge for the taking. He says if he'd been a religious man, he would have fallen to his knees and thanked God for providing sanctuary. Not being a religious man, he stayed on his feet and used a pair of bolt cutters to snap the lock at the main gate. At least that's how he recounted the tale. At the time, I was still an infant curled against his chest in a baby sling. Gradually, he replaced all the chains and padlocks with new ones that he'd scavenged from a builder supply store on the highway. That store, or the ruins of it anyhow, is still my favorite place to forage. All my best tools have come from there. We can use our gasoline power generator to electrify the fence if a horde of outliers suddenly appears, but normally we don't need it. Sure, they can smell us like a hyena can smell carrion, which gets them foaming at the mouth, but they can't climb or dig or use what limited brains they have to reason a way to get at us. It's only when a lot of them congregate that Daw throws the switch so they don't accidentally shove their way inside our compound, en masse. The electric shock tends to do the trick. It either sends them scurrying back into the woods or it electrocutes them on the spot. We use heavy vinyl zippered body bags we salvage from a fire station to haul the dead ones to a quarry pit near the highway. In the pit, purple and green slime coats the watery surface like the northern lights artistically depicted in pollution. The corpses slip below, usually without making much of a splash. Da makes me wear a pair of biohazard coveralls and a breathing mask when we perform this duty. I don't mind. The suit makes me feel like an astronaut bounding across the surface of the moon. Mostly, though, the outliers just stand beyond the fence and howl like banshees and salivate. Long strands of iridescent mucus looping from their mouth slits, futilely tearing at the wire with their bony fingers, starving, scenting fresh meat nearby but unable to get at it. That's why they howl. Frustration, I think. Fewer and fewer each year, Da suspects they're slowly migrating south like refugees from some devastating war, where it's warmer, where their kind thrives. Or it's possible they're dying off, whether from disease or natural causes. It's hard to tell. We don't go near the dead ones we come across in the woods, since we rarely travel with our biohazard suits in our backpacks. Their decomposing corpses are rife with virulent bacteria, viruses and toxins, Daw says. Lurching biothreats. Better to keep our distance. We have no way of calculating their contagion factor, or if they represent an airborne threat to us. Da suspects their excretion may be seething with bacteria, in the same way a leper's nasal droplets are rife with leprosy. That's a theory, not a scientific conclusion, since we don't want to risk finding out. Da believes their lifespan is shorter than ours, maybe a quarter of that of a human who live, on average, 75 years, or at least they did in the before. So 
17 or so years of a life for an outlier. Maybe less. Maybe more. I don't know for sure. Da says in a couple of years, if and when we haven't seen a single outlier during 30 consecutive days of summer, we'll load up our packs and head south. Look for other humans. Just see if there's anybody out there. He thinks there must be. Because of the telephone. Da obsesses over that telephone. Even now. I've seen a hundred phones. Probably more. Cell phones, smartphones, hard light phones plugged into modular jacks in the wall. All from the before. All left behind during evacuation. Maybe on purpose, maybe by accident. All dead. No bars, no dial tone. As a matter of habit, Da picks up every phone he comes across to see if it's working. Even the old pay telephones mounted in cracked glass boxes. Da explained to me how telephones worked. How they were a tool to talk to other people when you weren't face to face. I've read a biography of Alexander Graham Bell, so I get the concept. Hello? 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 He says. Always pitch higher at the end, as a question. Force of habit, I expect. Though it seems a bit strange to me. I figure that's how people used to answer the telephone. With a hopeful question. It was the tail end of winter a few years back, and our last foray into the beyond before we curtailed our trip due to warmer weather. The melting snow heralded the milder days of spring when the outliers would emerge. Accordingly, the distance we could travel outside our compound was limited to sprinting distance. A simple fact. In warm weather, it wasn't safe to roam even a foot farther than what we could easily traverse at top speed and get back behind our perimeter fence before the outliers caught us. We measured the distance at the beginning of each new year. I got a little faster and Dog got a little slower, so the safety zone fluctuated a bit. But this day was cold. Cold enough to walk freely in the beyond without looking over our shoulders every five seconds. The beyond was peppered with isolated homesteads, what Dog called quaint villages and even some small towns. We made a map of places we'd visited and what supplies still remained to be salvaged. But in the early days, Da wanted to travel as far as we could. We didn't take the truck most of the time because the roads were clogged with abandoned vehicles or fallen trees. We set out on foot, pulling our sled behind us, usually with a couple of dogs. He always said we were looking for supplies and books, but I knew he was hoping to find other humans. He just never said it out loud. We'd come upon a resort village where the ski lift gondolas hung like decaying Christmas ornaments between the trees. I'd learned to make a beeline for the on-site restaurant, which more often than not had a pantry room filled with paint-sized canned sauces and vegetables and condiments. When I saw the sign, Fine Dining, I took off at a trot, hoping to find a can of chocolate frosting on the shelves. It had been a while since I'd tasted anything sweet. When I heard the ringing, I stopped at my tracks. I had no idea what it was. I'd heard the tinkle of bells when we'd push our way through the doors of small shops. And I lived with the pleasing sound of fluttering wind chimes in our compound, but this was different. For one thing, there was no wind. A telephone! Doc cried. He dropped the harness to the sled and charged toward the lobby of the long empty lodge. It kept ringing. Intermittent rings. I took off after him. A sign had fallen over and blocked the doorway. It took us nearly 30 desperate seconds to dislodge it from the mud and leaves so we could pull open the door. Da squeezed through an opening I could barely manage to scramble through. It was a hardline phone, an old one, black, with a rotary dial rather than a keypad. It sat like a vulcanized toad on the counter. Hello? He shouted into the receiver. Hello? I waited in the doorway, holding my breath, the dogs confused by the excited energy running in circles outside in the snow. Hello? Hello? I'd never seen Da cry before. But he slumped to the floor, the receiver clenched in his gloved fist, tears running down his face, his mouth open in an O of grief. I pried the receiver out of his fingers. I knew one end was for talking and one for listening, but both had little holes punched through the hard plastic so it wasn't immediately apparent which was which. I held it up to my ear. Nothing. Then I turned it upside down. A metallic buzzing. Dial tone. Da wiped his face and took the receiver from my hand. Maybe they'll call back. He hung up the phone. We both looked at it for a long, long time. It didn't ring. We ended up staying at the lodge for nearly a week, 
so long that I worried we wouldn't make it back to our compound before the first thaw of spring. I took care of the dogs, cooked our meals, and scoured the area for supplies while Doss sat next to the phone, waiting for it to ring. Or at least that's what he did half the time. The rest of the time, he dialed the numbers he'd found listed in a phone book. He'd let the phone ring 20 times on the other end. Then he'd try a new number. When he ran out of listed numbers, he dialed random numbers. No one ever answered, and the phone never rang again. There's someone else out there, boy, he insisted. The skin on his index finger had grown callous from dialing. I didn't want to say that I thought otherwise, that the ringing had been a fluke. Maybe a short on an old line, or a surge of electricity from a transformer hit by lightning. A million possibilities. But Da imagined someone like himself sitting somewhere dialing numbers at random, hoping against hope that someone would answer. Da's stubborn. He wouldn't leave. Only when the dial tone finally ceased did he emerge from the lodge. We followed the telephone wires from the building to the pole, and we followed the line of old tar-drenched poles for more than a mile until they stopped at the wires disappeared underground. He stared for a long time at the ground. When we went back to the lodge to gather our gear, he checked for dial tone one last time. Nothing. I witnessed a faint light extinguish in his eyes, or maybe it was a trick of the flickering rays of the setting sun but he never mentioned the ringing telephone again. I didn't bring it up either. I know he thinks about it, though. You're listening to Outliers, narrated by Rory Culkin. Produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Listen away. Outliers is executive produced by Dave Beasley, and narrated by Rory Culkin. Created by Cassandra Wells and Dave Beasley. Based on the novella Outliers by Cassandra Wells. Produced for Realm by Alexis Latshaw and Haley Wagreich. Additional sound design and editing by Rory O'Shea. Cover art by Kendall Thomas and Michał Krasnopolski. <laughs>